Live on YouTube, <laughs> soundtrack. Oh my God. Did you do a commercial for <laughs> It sounded like a serious like, court show or something. <laughs> Great, thank you. So let's call, call our meeting together. But it's like to let the COCC board directors meet. And let's uh, like to uh, read the uh, hidden lands of acknowledgement. I'll ask everyone to uh, please uh, be patient with me. My Spanish teacher in high school said I my tongue did not roll, and he was very patient to get me to graduate. So please uh, be patient with me. The purpose is to acknowledge someone is to say, I see you, you are significant. The purpose of our land acknowledgement is to recognize and pay respect to the original inhabitants of a specific of, of a specific region. There's an opportunity to express gratitude and appreciation for those whose territory you exist in. The OCC would like to acknowledge that the beautiful land our campuses reside on are the original homelands of the Wasco and the Orange Bay people. They ceded this land to the U.S. government in the Treaty of 1855. The Piot people were forcibly moved to the Orange Springs Indian Reservation starting in 1879. It is also important to note that the Klamath Trail ran north through this region to the Great Sonora Falls trading, trading grounds, and the Klamath Falls claim it as their own. The descendants of these original people are thriving members of our community today, and we acknowledge and thank the original stewards of this land. There are Indian uh, names that I didn't uh, do because I'm embarrassed and do mess them up, so I'll do some more practicing for the next year. I never did them. Well, I, I had feedback after the first time I read it that it's actually better to do the anglicized version if you're not from the tribes. Right. So well, I appreciate that. So, so you, you, you did it correctly fun. without. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. So with that, uh, we'll call. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, Joe Penowitz? Yes. Laura Kraska Cooper? Here. Alan Unger. Here. Erica Scaffold. Here. Jim Porter. Here. Aaron Murd. Here. Aaron Foot Morgan. Here. Alicia Moore. Here. Anne Marie Hamlin. Here. Michael Lalonde. Here. Laura Bomi. Here. I know Zach Boone's joining us as soon as he arrives from Madrid. Julie Downing. Here. Krista Harris. Here. Paul Taylor. Here. Kathleen Knudsen. Here. Kyle Matthews. Here. And Ben Gilbert. Thank you. Uh, any agenda changes? Uh, I'd like to add one, uh, probably put on, underneath that new business number four, and that's the appointment of our board of meeting appointments. And I have that here at Um One change from uh, 11A that's actually going to be postponed to a later meeting uh, the ABS contract proposal. No, it's not going to be addressed tonight. Not tonight. Yeah. It'll likely be in September. All right. Very good. Okay, uh, we are at the point of public comment, comments. And do we have any, anyone on Zoom at all? Gentlemen, nothing is submitted in advance. Okay. Thank you. Okay, the consent agenda. Um, any uh, additional comments or any questions? Move approval. Second. Motion to amend made. Second. Everyone in favor can say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, here's the fun part. We get to swear in our new uh, board members. We're glad to have them on board. And if I can have everyone down, let's, uh, let's meet right over here. Can we just take our paperwork on those? Yes. Yes. Yeah. We didn't memorize it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, but I need to find mine. It's uh, item seven. Got it. Okay. So the other the following is a draft if this is the open office for newly elected in solid four members and the OR for three four one point three two six uh dash four requires board members to take an oath of an office as qualified to serve the board as they would be. The regular constitution also requires elected officers to take an office the open office. There is no requirement for the open to be notarized unless that is the local practice for policy of the public board. It is a good idea to note that in the meeting notes, meeting notes and other board makers can state that the oath was administered in my opinion. So, um, 
I'll ask you to start. Bye. Right. Okay, first, what's your name? Bye. Bye. Hi, I'm Aaron Burks. We're going all at once. Please only swear or affirm that I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution and the laws of the state of Oregon. The Constitution and the laws of the state of Oregon. And the policy of the Central Oregon Community College. And the policy of the Central Oregon Community College. During my term, I will faithfully during my term, I will faithfully and partially discharge the responsibilities of the office to the best of my ability. And partially discharge the responsibilities of the office to the best of my ability. Yes, no other job I <laughs> and to the next item, uh, the election of the new chair and vice chair for the COC board of directors. I'd like to move that Joe Crenna was be our next chair. I'll second. Any other nominations? So with that, um, we'll okay. pause nominations. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, everyone in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Mm -hmm. Thank you. And now the vice chair, um, this typically will be our upcoming chair for the 20, uh, 23, 20, oh, 24, 25 uh, board. Uh, so. I'd like Every to nominate Laura Crestley Cooper for vice chair. I'll second that. Okay. Motion's been made and seconded. Or is any other nominations? The motion's been made and seconded. Everyone in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Great. Thank you very much. Lori, we're we'll back up on the DS again. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Well, you know, uh, I guess we do have the community appointment center. Sorry about that, Kyle. I didn't realize you already put that in. These two are Appreciate that. Um, I'll pass this out. Does everyone have a copy of this? Did you they already pass this? Okay, great. <laughs> so I went through everyone's uh, request. Um, new and I uh, just need board members. I think I met everyone's uh, expectations of, of uh, putting them on a committee that they requested. Uh, one or two of them, I think, they knew everything. Uh, so for the 2324, it's highlighted in, in yellow. Um, my recognition for chair as well as participants in that specific committee. Um, if there's any changes, we can certainly entertain it now. Or if you want to pull out your um, gloves and talk with another person, we can um, quite figure out a different position. Do some swapping, some, some trading. Yeah. Is that what? Okay. So. Could I could I request Joe um, on the policy review committee? Because when we got this kind of, it was sort of stagnant for a while or dormant, I guess is the better word. And so the last few years we've done, I think a lot of really good work on modernizing the policies. But I think it would probably be helpful to have the policies sent out to all of the board members so that those of us who have been on the board can be refreshed and those who are new can see them because obviously it's the board's pleasure what our policies look like. So to the extent that um, we review them and say, oh, we should work on that one or change that one, I think that would be really helpful to get the committee started. Yeah, and then as you're reading through them, especially the new board members with fresh eyes, please point things out and then us as a committee can meet and work on it. Mm -hmm. Yes, we had a, uh, our previous board uh, uh, last two years in Fort and uh, about uh, four years, we have had some adjustments and changes, and uh, it was to new eyes, so it was good. So we entertain that very seriously. Mm -hmm. Any other comments in regards to the community assignments? One quick comment. Um, Kyle, to make sure the College Affairs has um, Aaron's email address so he can get the minutes and all that in the meeting schedule together. Got it. It's a good committee. Any other comments or anything? I'd entertain a motion to approve uh, the 23 24 
Committee questions. So moved. Yeah. Motion is not made. Second. Everyone in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. Thank you. Okay, we're on the information items. Um, you know, Kathleen here and Laura. Any items that you saw in our packet you would like to address with our staff? Okay. I have a comment. <clears throat> when I went through and looked at the information, let's say like these, we get on some of them, we get more detailed information. But it's like, okay, the small business management coordinator position. I don't know what it is. And it would be a good time to just add a little bit more about what the what the position is and, and its function. So it just helps me understand it better. Yeah. I like the other stuff. I like to know where they came from and everything, but that's one part I would like to have. So, so more uh, definition yeah. of, of, of the positions. Being yeah, explain what the Pathways Board Program Coordinator does. Just a summary. Yeah. Yeah. Was, was the Senior Assistance Administrator the position the one that was open for a while? Yeah. Oh, congratulations! Yeah, found her right here. We finally hired a type of person. We got excited. No, Dan Albergetti. It's been a real success, I think, for all of us. Dan Albergetti is actually um, a tenured professor here at COCC and had decided to work for IT for a bit to get some um, more front facing real world experience. So, this is a really good deal for college and for my job. But to, to address that, there is a in other job description. So, for example, the one that's pathways program coordinator, there is a summary of what the job is. Would that satisfy what you're asking, Alan? If we included the summary of the yeah. position in this, okay. So, great book to you too. Erin sort of highlighted that too. Right. Something she wanted. Um, so, looking at the, the Employee of the Year and Diversity Award recipients, are, is there anything you would like to call out in regards to those that are folks? Yes, and, and um, I want to say um, on the faculty front, I think Dan Marie could speak to that more so than myself, but uh, Administrator Confidential and Classified, um, those are ones where their peers select them and submit nominations on, on their behalf. And so uh, each of these individuals is very deserving of uh, the award. And just for knowledge, because we do have some new people, at least for the administrator, confidential and classified, the uh, award includes a thousand dollar payment to the employee, uh, a designated uh, parking space for an entire year, which used to be a big deal. <laughs> they, they were so busy, but um, still a good thing. You get to pick your parking spot. And then, of course, they get a, another kind of award that they get to keep. And uh, so it's it's a very uh, prestigious thing that they get not only by their, their peers. And then, uh, uh, yeah, similarly with the faculty, they are nominated by their peers, but sometimes we get student nominations um, for these people too. And both Kathy Smith and Mike Rich, um, who were awarded these awards this year, have been with us a long time, and um, they have a lot of students that, that have really benefited from their instruction, and we had a number of nominations from the students for these faculty. Highly deserved. That's very good. And I was really thrilled to see Susie get that. She's, she's a wonderful representative for COCC and for Kim. Great. Uh, we have a presentation on high school partnerships. Right, ready now. So we have, we're happy to have uh, Krista Harris here, who's the uh, high school partnerships manager for COCP, and we've asked her to um, give kind of an overview for those who are newer to COCC of what high school partnerships is all about, what we do, and then ask her to also talk about um, the work and the strides that they've made in that area over the last year or more. Chris, <laughs> Thanks so much for having me. 
Uh, my name is Krista Harris, and my role here at COCC is High School Partnerships Manager. Um, so that looks like a lot of different things, but primarily what I do is manage our College Now program, which I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, but I'm really excited to share with you what our team has been working on around high school partnerships. So a quick overview, I'm going to give you a quick definition of uh, what we refer to as accelerated learning. I'm going to talk a little bit about what that looks like here at COCC, um, the different options that we have, give you some data to show you how our enrollment is looking in those in the current program. Um, we're going to take a closer look at college now because that's primarily what I work with, and I want to share with you a little bit about what we're doing um, with that aspect of it. Talk a little bit about all of the great opportunities and some of the challenges that we're working really hard to um, overcome for our students. Uh, and then talk a little bit about the connection that our high school uh, option have to the recruiting and outreach efforts at COCC overall. And then if I can answer any questions for you, I am happy to do that. So um, in Oregon, we define the educational experience that provides high school students with the opportunity to earn college credit um, and accelerated learning. And that can look like a couple of different things that we'll talk about. Uh, but that's just kind of our definition here in Oregon. So you'll hear us use that accelerated learning language a little bit. So when we describe accelerated learning at COCC, we put it into two big buckets primarily. So we have uh, concurrent courses, which are standard COCC courses that a high school student can enroll in. They can take on at any of our campuses or online. Um, and they're in the classroom with all of our other traditional students as well. Um, it gives them access to a wide variety of classes that they can take and kind of expand their learning. The, they pay a, the standard tuition rate. Um, typically, they don't pay it out of pocket. So the high schools often have um, funding available to support them in taking those classes. Um, but the rate would be that standard tuition rate. The other big bucket is college now, and that's primarily what I do. And so those are courses we actually offer out in our high schools. Um, the high school instructor has to be approved through COCC. And we have some standards that they have to meet in order to get approved. And we have some different avenues that we can take to actually get them approved. Um, it's a super um, accessible way for students to earn credit. It's right there in their high school according to their, to their high school schedule. So it's very convenient for them. In addition, we offer those courses at $25 per credit. So most of the classes we have out in the high school are three or four credits. So $75 to $100 for a class that would cost much more up, up here. Um, so it's a great um, savings for them. But really the, the key for that for college now is really the accessibility of it. Um, we can deliver those courses um, out to our high school but perhaps don't have the same access to one of our um, COCC campuses. So it's a great opportunity. And then we also occasionally will do a contracted course out of our high schools. So if our high schools need a specialized course, we do CNA, um, we've done some languages, we're doing automotive out in warm springs. So if we, um, if the high school wants perhaps a specialized course, a course that they maybe don't have a high school instructor who can teach it, um, and they don't have a way to get their students to do this for some reason, um, we can bring the course to them. So when we bring that course to them, we're also bringing a faculty member to them at their location. We don't, this isn't something we do a lot of, but it's a really great tool to have um, in special situations where it makes sense. A little bit about on our data. And if anyone's interested in more specific data, we actually have some, we've worked with our IE team to create some dashboards that allow us to um, work um, with our data, use it when we're making decisions and kind of tracking on different things. So please let me know if you're interested. I, I'm not going to bore you with too much detail today. Um, so concurrent enrollment, again, that's those classes uh, high school students are taking on campus with one of our COCC faculty. Um, 
No, I just wanted to try to make it a little bit easier for people to see. So we have two, um, we're, we're measuring it two different ways right here. So this is overall enrollment. Um, and from 21, 22 to 22, 23, we saw a little over a 17% um, increase in overall enrollment, which is really exciting. Uh, this other metric over here is measuring individual students, right? So we have uh, many students who are taking multiple classes, right? Um, we also saw an increase of uh, just over 24% of the number of students taking uh, advantage of that opportunity as well. So we're seeing some really good growth, which is exciting for us. Um, and the kind of the critical thing that we're doing with this, all of this concurrent enrollment is managed by our admissions and records office, our high school options team. Our job is really to promote this opportunity for them. So we're thinking through other ways that we can better promote the program, but then also help students navigate those enrollment steps so that we actually get them enrolled in class. And then college now, again, we do our, our classes out in the high school. So same kind of metrics, um, overall enrollment. We I mean, a tiny little um, increase, which was exciting for us, um, just under a percentage. We saw more students participating, which is really exciting for us because um, we're really trying to get at access for students with these classes. So we also saw an increase in the number of students who were participating. Um, and really what you're seeing here is us working really hard to rebuild after COVID. Um, that really impacted our high school landscape. So we're working really hard to kind of rebuild, especially with some of the turnover we've seen in our high schools and things like that. So with our College Now program, this is just kind of a visual of the high schools we serve. So, so typically, we're serving our in-district high schools. Occasionally, we will serve an out-of-district high school, and that is only if we receive our release from their home institution that says, hey, we're not able to accommodate this request from a high school in our district, COCC, can you uh, support them on our behalf? And sometimes we see this when a community college in their area doesn't have a program they're looking to um, articulate with, like culinary or something like that. So we can step in and provide that support on behalf of them. So do they do they participate in your is out of district? I saw a camp there. Yeah. Do they participate in any uh back building of funds in regards to do, do their students? Is there some type of a funding mechanism that we're getting paid for them to do what you're doing? So doing they do that? still pay that $25 per credit rate. Okay. I'm not sure if I'm answering okay. your question right, okay. but they do they do still pay that $25 per credit rate. And when they don't, we don't have a backbone mechanism on that front, Joe. But one of the things, and maybe Krista, you're going to share this a little bit later, the yield rate that we see out of students who take dual credit classes while in high school who then come to COCC is incredibly high. So even at that, even with that course being offered at such a steep discount, usually there are returns for us. At least historically, there have been. So I get that, but the folks over 12 or 10, yeah. you, you see the yep. same. Okay. Great, great. Yeah. yeah, and that's a good point. Um, so we do track on, of the students who earn college credit while they're in high school, whether it's through concurrent enrollment or a college now class, we're tracking on what percentage of those students then matriculate to COCC one year after high school graduation. 26.7% 26 26 was our um, our number for the 21-22 year. So we're tracking on, you know, what kind of, uh, progress are we making? What kind of impact are we having? How many of those students are showing up here at COCC? And our goal really is to increase that percentage. Um, the other thing we track, um, internally we track, is also just how many of those students are pursuing higher education in general, whether it's at COCC or elsewhere. How do you how do you track that? By request transfer or to send transcripts or 
I do my our IE team, so I'll have to research and figure out how they were again. Oh, gotcha. So the National Student Clearinghouse, uh, 95 plus percent of all the colleges and universities in, in the country report all their enrollment data to the clearinghouse, and we can um, ask for reports in that regard. So if we have a relationship with a student or a group of students, that's where we get that other rate about where they're going, uh, not only who's going on to higher ed, but where else they're going. And but they'll report names. Uh, we give them names and they give us back the aggregate data. That's cool. Yeah. Thank you. You bet. So then with our College Now program, we um, are offering classes out in our high school. Some are transfer courses, writing, math, history. We also offer some CTE courses, so uh, culinary, welding, um, medical terminology. We have some classes, education and business that kind of land in both, depending. Um, and this is kind of our average breakdown, the courses that we have out in the high school, uh, what percentage are transfer courses, what percentage are CTE courses, uh, just so you know kind of what the mix looks like. It looks different at every high school. So each of our high schools have different courses that they're offering. Some of our high schools have a very robust um, menu of college now classes, and other high schools were in the process of building those opportunities for them. Um, with transfer courses, our goal really, because this is credits with a purpose, we don't want students just accumulating credits without some type of strategy. So we're really encouraging them to kind of be thinking ahead to what is my academic um, goal, what is my career goal, and how can we help them make really good decisions about on what classes that they're taking. Um, and some of the cool stuff we do, we, we're working on doing with CTE is figuring out how can we build better pipelines into our CTE programs, whether it's um, putting the prerequisite courses out in our high school so when they graduate, perhaps they've completed uh, the majority of their prerequisite courses and are able to move into a CTE program, um, or are there any classes that we can put out there that just give them some exposure to that program that feels that type of thing? So looking ahead, um, we are um, wrestling with some challenges. And oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, no. Yeah. You said you help the students with their path. Yeah. Do we do that, or does the student counseling battle at the high school? Very good question. We are super fortunate. So we okay. have a, a position, high school, the college navigator. Um, her name is Erica Carmen, and she is amazing. And she's our boots on the ground in the high schools. Okay. Um, so she's out in the high schools working alongside the counseling teams and the students to help um, navigate some of this. In addition, she's getting them connected with our academic advising that we have up here at the college so they can receive that support as well. One of the things we found is that our high school counselors have a ton on their plate, right? And so they're trying to do this, this kind of work, um, but they have a lot going on. So we are trying to meet them where they're out at and provide that type of um, support. So we have one staff member. But we have an advising team. So really, okay. um, part of her goal is to talk with students and get them connected with an academic advisor. So she kind of um, serves in the in-between, but yeah. And, and other resources as well. If they have questions around other services we provide, um, that's kind of her job is to help them navigate that transition. Yeah. And I think it's a state, a state paid position and it's a program they just kind of started. Yeah, you might be thinking of this, um, Career connected the career connected learning. learning. Thank you, Cindy. Yeah. This one is a, is a COCC funded position, but right. there is also then the career connected learning navigator that helps middle schoolers, high schools make that thoughtful, intentional decisions around how to connect their classes to a career. That is the state funded one. Both of them real important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and it's a great way for us to build relationships and to have her out there connecting with them so we know how to respond to their needs better. So in terms of some of our challenges, um, like you said, one staff court person, right? So um, building capacity both within our staff, right? But also um, within our faculty as well to be able to um, expand and grow these offerings and provide that type of support. So capacity is a challenge, um, especially as we're looking to grow the program. Uh, also removing barriers. So um, $25 per credit, it's it's a great deal. Um, it still can be a financial barrier for, for students. So looking at ways we can try to help overcome that barrier for them. Um, 
And then we do have competition in our district. So we do have other uh, colleges and universities who are serving our high schools in different ways. And so being able to uh, address that as well. And then we have tons of opportunities. So um, our high schools are just like knocking on our door. How can we get more college now classes, right? This is a great option for our students. It's so accessible, it's affordable, things like that. So we have lots of interest from our high schools to grow and expand and develop those partnerships. Um, we also have a great opportunity to try to strengthen pipelines into our CTE programs, which we're really excited about, um, especially as we see our high schools doing more and more around CTE and there's some excitement there. And then um, we have this great opportunity just to um, build partnerships, build relationships with our K-12 folks. Why is the funding structure different from the concurrent classes versus the college now? Sure, that's a good question. And, and maybe you can help, help yeah. me with this. So students who are taking concurrent classes are mixed, are on a college campus or in an online class with other traditional matriculated admitted college students. So they're interacting with our faculty to the same degree any other college student is. So from a sense of equality in the classroom, everybody's paying that same tuition rate. Mm -hmm. In the high schools, they're taught by uh, the high school instructors whose salaries are covered by the high school. So it does lessen the cost burden to the college in that sense. So that's a big, big piece of it. Whereas concurrent students are taking classes with our faculty, we pay those salaries, those benefits, all of that piece that uh, will credit the, uh, the programs Chris is talking about college now, those are ones that are taught by high school instructors, not paid by CEO system. Okay, but doesn't the high school cover the concurrent? In Does some situations, okay. high schools have access to a pool of funds um, that they can choose to use, but it also then depletes their funding. It's called the ADM or associated, what is it? Accelerated daily means or associated daily means. It's our equivalent of FTE dollars, mm -hmm. and they can choose to use those to pay for um, students to take college classes at COCC or in the high schools. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's each high school does it differently. Okay. okay. That's what I remember is that you just got to take classes at COCC in the yeah. yeah. uh -huh. yeah. high school. <laughs> yeah. My high school. Yeah. yeah, we find it differs so much from one high school to, to the next in terms of what funding they have and how they choose to, to allocate it. Even within a district. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So so if they don't pay for it, then it comes out of the student's pocket to pay the full tuition. Yeah. Yes, it does. Yes. Speaking of personal experience. Okay, so you're yeah. nice, nice left out. <laughs> in certain circumstances, yes. they do. In other yes, circumstances, yeah. they don't. It's complicated. <laughs> okay, that's good for now. Mm -hmm. So then just real quick, our connection, our, we, we've got concurrent enrollment, we've got college now, um, we're building out these opportunities for our high school students to earn credit through accelerated learning. And really, we see that as a, as a recruiting mechanism, it's a pre-recruiting mechanism. We're out in the high school getting them um, some exposure to COCC and college coursework. Um, and we're really trying to find them up so our recruiting and outreach team can go in and do all of the good work that they, they do. So one of the things we're trying to do is really make a really intentional um, handoff to our recruiting and outreach team um, so that they can um, go in and promote the skill programs that COCC had um, and the opportunities that higher education brings. And so we have um, a very uh, collaborative relationship with our recruiting and outreach team and I think they do amazing work and we're really grateful for that partnership. So do you, you work directly with the high schools and the administration? Because one of the, this is one issue that I understand is getting resolved. I think I mentioned this before. Um, but one of the barriers that we've had to having students in Kirk County attend on the campus, you know, campus is walking distance from the high school, which is great, but the bell schedule is different. Yeah. And so you couldn't, you couldn't walk down there to COCC take class because after your last class got out at CCHS, you're halfway through, you're missing the first half of yeah. the class. And I understand that's being worked on or has been fixed. I don't know that it has been fixed. It is something that comes up in a lot of our conversations, even beyond Crook County High School, even here in, here in Bend and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, the challenges of trying to fit in a, you know, a concurrent course that operates on COCC, you know, schedule, right? And built in, making that work with a high school schedule is super challenging. Um, and so we've, we've started to brainstorm ideas about like, you know, what might we do? How might that look different, right? And, and trying to explore some of those types of things. So it is a topic that comes up and, and we're brainstorming, but I don't know that we've 
resolved, <coughs> if not resolved, always in conversation. Yeah. And as we build enrollment on the on, on the campus and other branch campuses, we'll have more flexibility to make those kinds of changes. But if we make those kind of changes, we'll we grow enrollment. What do you have a tribute? Uh, attribute the growth to, I think it was college now, there was significant growth, or did I have that spot? No, you're probably right. Some of it yeah. has to do with you know, dip with COVID, right? Yeah. And so we kind of are on the rebound. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's really our efforts to get more opportunities out to the high school, but also um, them embracing the value it has for their students, promoting it for their students and things like that. Um, so I think it, it's a combination of things. The data might look a little skewed because of, of COVID and the dip we saw, um, but really we're making a concerted effort to push those opportunities out to our high schools um, and really have them reflective of what we think really fits well uh, for a high school student. So one of the things we always we always go into the, our conversations with our high schools um, is a perspective of um, let's talk partnership, right? And not a cookie cutter approach. So what makes sense for your high school? Um, and some of them, the big high schools, you know, they want maybe volume, right? Uh, or multiple sections or whatever it may be. Some of our other high schools are looking for variety. Their students are interested in getting to sample different things or they have a very big CTE focus or something like that. So we try also to make our college now course offerings reflective of that high school audience. So $25 uh, can be a, uh, a bump in a decision to participate. Is there any way do you hear from the counselors or from uh, your partnerships and well, we had 17 students that said we are not going to do. Uh, we we do hear from them. Um, they don't always quantify it that way, but we do hear from them. And one of the things that we try to do is advocate for students to talk with their counselors because sometimes the high schools will use some of those buckets of money to cover that college now course fee um, rather than to get a concurrent enrollment class, right? And their dollars go a little bit further, right? So we encourage that. Um, we're also always exploring, like, how, you know, do we have any flexibility around our um, our funding model, right? Like some of the community colleges in Oregon don't charge um, for their college now types of courses. So um, that's something that is um, big on our radar is, you know, how do we address that? And that's where we see some of that um, competition in, in our district, right? Some of our high schools have partnership with other community colleges. We don't charge, right? And so it's a tricky situation. The reason I ask that, you know, we do have scholarships. We have a scholarship group that takes care of all the scholarships for both Colorado and Badger High School and Bridges. But some of the scholarships are only, for, I shouldn't say they're only, they're $500. But for example, if the Lions said we will sponsor this program, mm -hmm. if you think about it, that's 20 sponsorships. Mm -hmm. There were, might be a bigger impact, particularly with that student. They're really look for college where I know there's programs out there, let's get this started. But something would be interesting to talk about. I know we, we probably have. My last time was well last year's. I think we had like seven five hundred dollars scholarships. They do go a long ways, but maybe they might be more effective. If, like say the mindset clubs will say, yeah, we'll sponsor them. Yeah. And we do hear from some of our high schools who have people step up and, and want to provide some money to support students in the that credit, which is really important. Um better together. Um, it's a great program. I used to go to those meetings as a local government supporter, and I remember one that Alicia was at that, um, boy, COCC added a lot of value to those meetings and information that helped. I think we were talking FAFSA or college night or something, and um, it just made a difference. So I just wanted you to talk about that. Do you do those? Who does? We've got a bunch of different people, Joe, at the college who are sitting on various different Better Together work groups. I don't have them all off the top of my head, but um, I know that Christy Walker, Director of University Inclusion, helps with some of the transition uh, it, groups that work from the kids going from uh, middle school to high school. We've got, I don't know if Wendy Worthington is part of any of them. Wendy Worthington, our Career Connected Learning Navigator, is part of them. Lori sits on a couple of different groups. So there's off the top of my head, five to six, maybe seven people at the college that are involved with Better Together in some capacity. Could you tell these three what Better Together is? 
I don't know if I have well, a little we response to that. I, I think that we had to bring all the school districts in Central Oregon K through 12 together to figure out how we yep. can do better together. Yep. Yep, you bet. Well, it. Yeah. 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 It's coordinated by yeah. Desert ESD um, as the coordinating body behind. behind. So, do you go back to the last slide? The they had your challenges and then opportunities. Um, so, what it what is the plan moving forward? Because they see opportunities, but that's not necessarily okay. like yeah. So one of the things we're doing is, um, as I mentioned, some of our high schools have a really robust menu of college now courses. Some of them do not. Mm -hmm. So we're making a very concerted effort to get out to those high schools and start building out some of those uh, college now courses mm -hmm. so that we can provide that access in, a, in an equitable way. And that's that's in addition to the high schools that you listen, listed, or is it those on the list. Those on the list. So yeah. some of those on the list have a very small menu of college now courses yeah. that we really need to expand it for them so that they have access to those things. So that's some of what we're doing. Um, one of the challenges that we have is that uh, we have some standards that high school instructors have to um, meet in order to be approved to mm -hmm. offer a course. Um, and often our high school instructors don't meet those requirements right out of the gate. So they need um, some additional support from our faculty. So we are building models that would support our ability to approve more high school instructors, which would allow expansion. Which, what, did, what, what are the gaps? So typically, curious, yeah. in terms of uh, qualification, yes. So um, typically, um, a high school instructor has to meet the same qualifications as a CUSSB instructor when teaching that course. Mm -hmm. And so with our transfer courses, often that's a master's in the discipline. Mm -hmm. Our K-12 folks typically have a bachelor's in the discipline or related discipline and a master's in teaching or a master's in education, mm -hmm. right? So that's kind of the, the disconnect there. But what we can do is um, our faculty, and we're doing more and more of this because it's a need, um, is develop trainings and support professional learning communities that help um, support those high school instructors around um, maybe gaps in the, the content um, or whatever it might be. So we're finding ways okay. to meet that. Okay, so you you have um, like a, a set, like, I'm going to say list of knowledge and that doesn't make any sense, but you, you know what they need to know. And then it's not that you want them to get a master's and you're supporting them and getting that. You're just trying to get them up to speed or yeah. Close. Okay. And for those are state regulations. So that's not just a CUCC imposed criteria. They have the master's in the discipline. So that's not something we've done, but it is an, it's an OAR or ORS. But we can provide training in lieu of that master's. Yes. Yeah. 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 So we have dual credit and sponsor dual credit and sponsor dual credit is the route that we go when the instructor doesn't meet those qualifications right out of the gate and needs some extra support yeah chris so for those schools that don't have a lot of college now courses yet yeah. you're looking at trying to keep up those offerings what does it look like to be reaching out to those high schools what Sure, that's great. So um, I typically work with the high school principal and an ability to talk about like what are the what are the priorities for Love High High School? Or that's exactly what I'm thinking. Um, we work we work with talk to Love High and they're wonderful, right? Yeah. And so um getting out to Love High and see, okay, what are the priorities? Um where can we start, right? And we start looking at what because the first step is course alignment, right? So figuring out, does that writing course at Lapine High School align with writing 121, right? Okay, it aligns. Next step, who's teaching that course? What are their qualifications? What kind of support do they need? So again, uh, not a cookie cutter approach, but going out to the high schools and saying, what do you want this to look like? Where do you want me to start? And starting to comb through their curriculum to figure out, okay, what can we do? So that's, a, that's part of what it looks like. We also <laughs> um, will work with High Desert ESD um, around the CTE programs, right? Mm -hmm. So our high schools that have different, uh, really strong CTE programs, sometimes what we can do is come in and layer on uh, a dual credit course, right? That, that complements that program really well. So not only are their students getting able to participate in the CTE program at the high school, um, but maybe they're able to gain some CUSC credit as well. Can you answer a little bit? I mean, if you think about what Chris just said, it's not only customized to the high school, it's customized down to the course. So that's a significant undertaking to get to the expansion that you were mentioning. Mm -hmm. 
uh, are all these in classroom classes or do we do distance learning or other yeah, ways of teaching? Like remote? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Most of them are in a traditional high school classroom. We have, let's see, one of our high schools that we work with um, does remote learning. And so we do have a couple of classes uh, articulated with them that are delivered remotely. Uh, that's a topic that we um, are still talking with some of our disciplines about, like how do we feel about um, remote delivery and things like that. So not it's not often that we articulate a remote course, but we have some. So it's not the students who can't do it, it's maybe other places in the system that make it difficult to put together, like does, this, does the school have the technical capacity and things like that. In terms of remote? Yeah. Well, most of our high schools are offering their classes in person. So that's why we're doing the in-person uh, in person articulation. In the limited cases where there are remote, we, we are starting to venture down that pathway, but that's really more the exception than the norm. Yeah. And, and unless the high schools shift their direction, then it's we need to be able to be there in the classroom with the student mm -hmm. five days a week. Or I should say the high school instructor needs to be there with them. Really, five days a week? It isn't. You know, some classes are two days a week. Varies from high school to high school. So you got to remember, these are all taught in the high school, on the high school schedule, based on how they offer their courses. And that's different from every single high school. Um, and so that's where it even gets more complicated. So it's not like we're just dropping um, writing 121 class into the high school. We're taking an existing high school class and adapting it to writing 121. Yes. And adding that's quite a lot of yep. engagement. Yeah. And one of the things we've heard from our high school, so the times that we do articulate the remote course, it's because that's the, the model the high school is using. Um, when we talk about you know, other avenues for offering accelerated learning, um there I think because of the experience they had with COVID, remote learning, um it hasn't isn't always a successful format for their students, so they they really can have a preference to be in person learning hands on. Um, so that's another aspect of it as well. I have another question because I just keep looking at the. So uh, the plan is to keep building in the schools, but your top challenge is building capacity and infrastructure to support the growth. So like. Do, do you have what you need to do though? What does like next year look like? Are you able to like achieve the goals you've set or? Yeah. yeah. So one of our big um, challenges when I first started you know, a year and a half, two years in the position was um, a lot of our systems were manual. Mm -hmm. So everything was very time intensive. And so that really um, was a challenge for us. So what we've done, we've spent the last year is really working on our in infrastructure, our systems, working with our ITS department who we're so thankful for right coming through with some uh technology solutions for us to automate some of our processes which makes a significant has a significant impact on um our ability to uh, grow our capacity so um, if we're not spending all of our time manually processing application mm -hmm. it frees us up to do all of the great things that we're really looking to do so we're spending a lot of time um leveraging technology systems partnering with different um, teams on campus to figure out how can we collaborate, how can we be more efficient, things like that. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know, if, well, it's a question, but it's, tech, it's a administrative. Can we get a copy of, of the um, um, slides mm -hmm. sent to email to us? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. Yes, the question for you. Mm -hmm. And please let me know if there's additional data or information you would like. Could we get um, the data on how many students in each, uh, the yeah. how many classes? Well, we talked about seats, I guess you said. How many seats and how many um, individual students from each of the high schools? So we have a sense of where all the high schools yeah. are. I, I'd be curious about the classes as well. How many classes? Absolutely. Yeah, our IE team has been amazing. They've built dashboards that narrow it down by high school, how, what courses, how many sections, how many students, how successful are they being? So oh, yeah, we'll take all of that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we love the data. So, right? so we're with yes. you. 100%. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So uh, this 
where is it now? This college runs on with acronyms that will not quit. I cannot remember what IEQ stands for. Institutional effectiveness. They're saying IE, like the institutional effectiveness. Yeah, they're the people that do the data. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. And they are awesome. They can probably answer all those questions. <laughs> Thank, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, I'm doing a new business. Uh, by night of morning, I've been set aside. Uh, Anne Marie, and in regards to the uh, RN to BSN exploration proposal. <laughs> Uh, Julie Dalian, instructional dean, hardly needs introduction to this group, though some of you are new, so I will let you know that Julie Dalian is uh, one of our CTE deans, dealing primarily with the healthcare field. When last year at this time, at, uh, no, it was, I think it was at the June board meeting, the board approved us to explore the possibility of looking at bachelor's degrees in line with what the state had provided permission for us to do. In May, I think it was Prime Bill meeting, Julie um, brought you a presentation on what we are thinking about doing with the uh, nursing program. And so today she's here to update you on that and uh, make a request related to the resolution in your packet. Do it. Thanks, Anne Marie. No, that was the candidate. That updated document okay. is behind the uh, committee appointments that I handed out earlier. So. Yeah, I'm sorry we had to do a little update on this, but we found out as you in the resolution, we had to have the exact wording that we can send it Bill 523. So oh. I didn't have it exactly right. Oh, Julie. I know. I'm sorry. We but anyway, thank you for having me tonight. As Henry said, I'm Julie Downing, and I have the privilege of overseeing all the health career programs here at the college, all the public service education careers. And disability services. Um, it's my thirty-third year at the college, which I still can't believe. But anyway, here I am. Um, so I'm doing the Cliff Notes version tonight because, as Emery said, in May we did this. But there's three of you that are new, right? The two Aaron's and Joe. So feel free to enter if you have questions. Jim, feel free Jim. to. Oh, sorry, Jim. Uh, so feel free to to ask. Okay. So let me uh, get myself oriented here. No, did we miss an item? No, this. Oh, no, okay, yeah. good. Yeah. It's like, oh, <laughs> is there a newer something that I didn't see here? So I don't know. Okay, so this one is all about nursing, right? So don't we already have nursing here? We do, right? So we have two things already. We have the nursing assistant program. We have our own, and we do, we teach nursing assistant for St. Charles as well. Also, we have associate degree, right? An ADN, associate degree in nursing, or associate of applied science in nursing. So those folks are, are end up being a registered nurse, right? So people say, well, what do we need a BS in or a bachelor's of science in nursing for? Well, we'll get to that in just a second, but I'll tell you, it's critical, right? <laughs> um, so if you can see, it's you know most hospitals um now are following this institute institute of medicine kind of goal right that 80 percent of their nurses be bachelor's of science prepared right and there is research showing that you know a bachelor's prepared nurse makes less errors has more experience better patient care just overall right um and within five years of being hired most of the hospitals want these folks for their own liability and that kind of thing right to be um prepared with a bachelor's degree in nursing so again, why do we need it? So currently there's no local opportunity to obtain a bachelor's of science in nursing here in Central Oregon. What most of our students do upon graduation if they want to get a bachelor's of science in nursing is they end up online at one of three places. You probably can guess where they are. OHSU, Linfield, and Mountain and Linfield. Close, most of ours don't go to OHSU, very rare. Um, Linfield is one of them. The biggest ones are Grand Canyon University and Western Governors mm -hmm. University, yeah. who have um, really slick, you know, online BSNs. But we've got students that are telling us, we don't want to do all online, we should do some online. And we trust and know you all in our community, so can you do it? And so finally now with Senate Bill, you can see in the second bullet there, Senate Bill 523 passed the Senate and the House and back to the Senate with audits and or, or edits. And um, so that passed, we're still waiting on 
Um, in your resolution, it says it was signed by a team coach. I think that was wishful thinking because it was supposed to happen yesterday, but um, <laughs> <laughs> hopefully tomorrow. Um, it's a technicality, but it, this will be all be the resolution, obviously, is contingent on her signature. Um, but that bill allows community colleges to offer a Bachelor of Science in Nursing because the demand is so great and there's such a shortage of nurses, right? So that's what the third bullet is about. You can see nurses need this um, BSN. We need to work on this shortage. Um, the other thing I want you to know um, there is, you know, you can see with the um, masters in nursing, we have a huge nurse educator shortage. So you can't produce more nurses if you don't have more nursing teachers or instructors, right? And you can't become a teacher if you don't have a BSN first. So we have to get more BSN so they can go get their master's. You can't get into a master's program with an applied baccalaureate and you can't get in with an associate degree. Makes sense. So we, it's, there's a lot of reasons why we need to do it. And also at the hospital, besides liability and those kind of things, these are the folks when they have a bachelor's of science in nursing, they end up floor managers. They end up in, promoted into higher paying positions, right? So that's important for their own economics. Um, so who would this serve? So you may have heard about accelerated BSNs. Anybody heard of that? Okay. So an Excel, there's different. So I want you to think of there's two different lanes because at some point in our community, we'll probably have an accelerated BSN. An accelerated BSN is different. So let me, let's go in that one. So an accelerated BSN is when you take somebody with an existing bachelor's degree, bachelor of science degree, right? In another area, like it might be engineering or it might be biology or something. And then they get accepted into a 15 month program where they become, they get a bachelor's of science in their shape, okay? But they already had a bachelor's of science in something else. Make sense? <laughs> what we're doing is not that. What we're doing is we're taking people who are already registered nurses, but are associate degree prepared, two-year degree prepared, and adding the last two years on so they can be four-year bachelor's degree prepared. Makes sense? <laughs> so different students, we'd be attracting the nurses and the accelerated programs be attracting people that have bachelor's of science in other areas. I know it's, it's confusing to people, but does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so what would we be doing? We would build a hybrid program. Um, Likely, like for some of the in person, or maybe some of the people like, oh my God, on Zoom, but like we might do some of that because these folks are working for the most part. They're already nurses, right? Most of them will be. So, we'll do some weekend, evening, they'll do some Zoom remote and, um, and some online, right? So, it'll be a little bit of everything. We're not sure yet about the numbers, but likely somewhere in the range of 24 to 48 students annually coming into the program, two year program. So, double that, right? In the second year, we have that many. Um, it's 90 credits because remember an associate degree is about 90 and you add on 90 for 180 degree, 180 credits for um, a bachelor's degree. We are looking at being um, part of a seven, we've been working on this for a year, part of a seven um, statewide, seven statewide school, right, consortium. Um, it might even be more. Um, and so now that this Senate Bill 523 passed, at one of the schools, Lane Community College, I know they're looking at, they're going to be doing their own um, and BSN, not part of this consortium, but there are seven that are going to be part of the consortium. I figure more brains are better than one and you can um, have a great program and then they can transfer back and forth if they need to, et cetera. So we are working on that feverishly. <laughs> so I wanted to just let you know what the next steps are. So we talked about governor's signature. Hopefully it will happen in the next day or two. The second one is, you, right? So the COCP board of directors approval, right? To um, uh, get this passed, right? This resolution. Um, and then the third bullet there, those are accrediting bodies, the NWCCU, gosh, Northwest, help me. Commission on Commission. Colleges and Universities. Thank you. It's institutional accreditation. We need to get approval from them. And Anne Ray is going to be helping with that. And then ASIN is our independent, you know, our national nursing accreditation. So we'll need to get that going eventually too. We need to get state approval on this consortium. So we have to get actual technical approval that we are a consortium. Uh, we have to get the curriculum approved at the state level. We have to get it approved at the state level so that this program is financial aid eligible. So we'll be working for you last year on that. Um, in August 7th and 8th, we're happy to welcome um, uh, faculty from all these seven consortium schools here to COCC, and they're going to be working on hammering out that curriculum. 
it's already had a good start. So don't think they're going to be hammering out two years of curriculum in two days. But um, you know, it's working together to, to get parsed out homework assignments, if you will. And then you know, once we get everything approved, we've got to hire folks, right, to run this program. And then the goal would be to open it fall of 25. Oh my gosh, it's so long. Why can't it can't be fall of 24? Well, all of this plus 20 billion other things that I didn't put on here, right? There's just a lot of steps that have to take place. Could we do it faster if we weren't part of the consortium? Maybe. Um, but I do think there's strength in numbers in this case. So I do think partnering on having the standard curriculum could be a really good thing. Um, so that's still something we have to technically decide, but um, we're not deciding that today whether we're part of the curriculum, or the part of the consortium or not, just whether we can do it. Um, and then we do have to determine selective admission. I'm looking at Cindy. We have to figure out like credit for CPL is credit for prior learning. Like, how are we going to look at that for the folks that come in? Because remember, this won't just be our graduates. It'll be anybody with an associate degree that's a registered nurse is licensed. Associate degree in nurse, you know, so we're gonna have to look at all that. And so that's my cliff notes version. Yeah. Can I ask, I, I've got a question that's like related to this, but it's not this. And this is something that I've never, I, I should have asked a long time ago. How is it that our nursing degree is a two year degree, but you come here first for two years to do prerequisites, then you do two years of nursing, and then you still need two more years to get your BSN? It, you're close. Um, it's one, it's about one, it's one year prerequisite courses. And those like with Chris, I mean, with the high school programs, a lot of these students now, they're clever and they're taking most of these in high school. And then they do the summer, they might be able to get, I mean, they might not have to do a full year, right? But it's about one year of prerequisites. Then they do two years here, right? But then they would go into the two year um, BSN program. So I have two Are nieces who came here and they both, maybe it was because they wanted to get their AAOT first. And then, yeah, then they, part of Laura, and also with the uh, nursing specific classes, they have so much time in clinicals and labs that those calculate different than a traditional college class would be. So it may take them two years time wise, but the credits are still equivalent to a more traditional two year degree in that sense. And now my niece is getting her uh, BSN at Linfield. And it's only it's supposed to take less than a year. There are some programs like that. It, but if you can think of it, has it's 90 credits. So that you can do the math on that. That's, All right. I guess it's just a one size does that. <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just talk it up to that. Thank yeah. you. And we do, because remember, our lane is these nurses that are already working. I think 90. Plus, we're certainly going to be working. So there's no way they could pull it off in less than two years. Yeah. Now, what we might think about doing is we could include the summer, right? Uh, so maybe it goes fall, winter, spring, summer, fall, winter, and kind of turn yeah. off. We could do that. We haven't gotten that far, but um, yeah. And then, sure. Um, this is an amazing program. It's so needed. It's awesome. I feel very lucky to be here. Be able to approve it actually tonight. Um, just curious what the cost of the program is, what you're estimating. Yeah, so we'll have to hire two to three full time people, and I think that's what, what do we estimate 130 or so with benefits. I forget. Um, so, so that would be just three, four hundred, four hundred thousand. Um, and what would we bring in intuition? The one thing that's interesting. Um, is when this the Senate Bill 523 passed, there is no initial FTE reimbursement for this program as we have for others. But the next time it comes around, next time there will be obviously they're already like planning it out. They'll be asking to um, change that. Can um, you so you explain what that means FTE reimbursement. Oh yeah, the full <laughs> full full time equivalency. That's part of the funding formula of the college, right? That we. Um, get reimbursed by the state per um so even though it's yeah so it is called a full-time equivalent or fte it doesn't mean if a student's going full-time we get reimbursed right on there's a weird formula that's been around and it's been around in a lot of states for a lot of years and nobody can explain where it came from but essentially every 510 hours that a student is in a seat online or or literal seat um that's considered one fte 
And so we might, I'm going to make it up, we might have 5,000 students, but we might only get reimbursement for 3,200 FTE. Yeah. It just depends on the enrollment patterns of the students, and then it is mm -hmm. fed into our funding formula. And there are a few courses that we don't get reimbursement for. Most of those are within the non-credit world. Is that given the basics without doing too much math? Right. So one of the things we will be looking at is um, will we need to charge a little bit different tuition rate for this? Mm -hmm. um, we don't want to charge what the universities are charging. We want to charge very close to our own tuition, but we may need to at least add some fees or have an increased tuition in there because it's this will be. I mean, it is cool, like you're saying, the first to be here for the first ever bachelor's degree at CSC and you know bachelor of science. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Aaron. Oh, just. Finishing oh, on the, the do is the goal to have tuition to cover the cost of the program, or will there be a little investment or close? Close. We will with some fees. It will be close, and depending on the number of students we have, right between twenty four and forty eight, that's pretty different. So, okay. so to see what the need, right. and we've we've had a lot of interest, so we know there's need and there's interest. It's just how much, mm -hmm. you know, if you build it, they will come, but how many? So, yeah, sorry, I have some more questions. Um, what other schools are in construction? Um, okay, so there's us, there's Klamath Community College, Lynn Benton Community College, Chemeketa Community College, uh, I think it's Treasure Valley Community College, Oregon Coast Community College, and I'm missing one. Uh, BCC? No. What? I'll get back to you on that. Yeah. I have it in my notes. So I can get it for you. Every, every, so. every one of them are looking at standing up their own program. All part of the same. We will build joint curriculum. We will all use the yeah. same curriculum. Okay. But the, at their location, they will all turn out. Everybody will offer it. Everybody will confer okay. their own degrees. Mm -hmm. It won't be like a, a degree from the consortium. It'll be a degree from COCC. Okay. Mm -hmm. But we will use joint curriculum. Yeah, Tillamook. Tillamook. I think it is. Yeah, Tillamook Bay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, there's your seventh one. And so will the students finishing their AA be able to roll into this program, or is it strictly or you have to be practicing in the, in the field? Students that graduate here from here with their AAS, which is yes. Associate Applied Science in Nursing. Yes. If you get an AAOT, that won't do it. You have to have an Associate Applied Science in Nursing. I think he's asking if you have to work before you go in, but you don't. You could go straight from the two years to the... You can go straight from graduating from here. The only thing you have to do is sit for your NCLEX, which is the National yeah. Nursing yeah. Exam, so that you're eligible for licensure. Yeah, that's part of the action. Okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Sorry, I didn't And the second part, yeah. access to it, is that going to be a lottery system? Or I, I see this big free bottom. That's still to be determined. Okay. My initial thinking, I mean, it will be a selective admission process. Okay. Right. Um, and so we are working on how we want to do that. We're meeting on Monday while all the, the consortium members are meeting, and that's one of the topics that we'll be talking about. The St. Charles have RMs, the AAs, AAs. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. The goal oh, is yeah. to hire BSNs, but yeah, we do hire in. Yeah, I mean, also, as we just met with Joan yesterday, I mean, a good number of their, their nurses are associate prepared RNs. Now, remember, my, my nieces. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Whether they have an associate degree or a bachelor's degree, they sit for the same exam, the NFLEX yeah. exam, and they yeah. pass it and they do the same scope of practice. They are a registered nurse, yeah. but just this will allow them to move up the scale and get better jobs and all better that. pay skills. Yeah. Pay better pay Thank you yeah. for bachelor's. Mm -hmm. Julie, I'm, a, I'm assuming that when you said uh, 2448, that has to do with whether we're going to have one cohort or two. Yeah. Is that? Okay, so I know that um, we've been asked in the past why we don't, you know, our nursing program is very competitive, um, has traditionally been, and we get a lot more applicants than we have spaces, yeah. and we've been asked how come we don't, you know, offer more spaces, and the, I know one of the real bottlenecks has been faculty, you yeah. know, you've got to have enough um, faculty, and you talked about hiring three folks to be able to do this, what about space, are we good with, because we're still going to continue our regular nursing program, right? Yeah. And so there's going to be some competition for the health careers space, right? Not How? too much, really, because a bachelor's of science in nursing doesn't have hardly any skill-based instruction. Mm -hmm. So they won't be in the clinic at all. They won't be in the lab much. It's more like 
managerial type of things. It's um, public community health types of things. Mm -hmm. So it's 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 more it's, it's different. It, it won't be as skill based. Um, and then in terms of like you know, St. Charles does want us to put out more nurses, right? So up until two years ago, we were putting out forty eight per year. We added one clinical group, right? The Oregon State Board of Nursing doesn't allow more. You have to have one instructor for every eight students in the clinic, right? So we added one clinical group. So now we have 56 each year. When matters gets going, which we're really excited about, we'll have another clinical group there of eight. So we've got that'll be eight, 16 more. Um, Henry and I met with Joan Ching yesterday from St. Charles. They want us to add another clinical group of eight and 24. So they will all be related to nurse faculty, whether we can get them or not. Um, so we are doing what we can. But so the same thing, 24 to 48 for, for this program will depend on how many, if, I mean, the, the critical point is whether you can get yeah. faculty. Yeah. But space, I'm not worried about space, like actual <laughs> physical space, because we just need to find a classroom. And these would be in the evenings and weekends, likely, right? Where our traditional nursing, ADN nursing classes are in the daytime. Well, we're better utilizing our building. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So do you have concerns about attracting your instructors? Yeah. I mean, salary wise, <laughs> I, I mean, you're 14. Yes. All yes. Yeah. Yeah. And what, I mean, probably unfair to ask you, but is there a strategy behind that? It's probably an HR question. I'm sorry. Uh, well, no, I, I think that simple answers. It's it's complicated, especially around our faculty contract. Yeah. Right? And um, at this point, this college is not invested energy into or interest maybe into having a differentiated salaries for different fields and that's as you can imagine in a collective bargaining agreement that's a that's a challenging topic to take on been there so yep <laughs> yeah. yeah but i mean it's so, a different time i don't think yeah. time. i can tell you that the difference between a nurse working at st charles and a nurse teaching here is 40 to forty five thousand dollars a year yeah my wife. difference yeah and, and, and they're, they're about to get races too. That's yes. with the race. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. so it was three, okay. and now we're saying but that's true in many of our fields. So it's not just a nursing issue. We have this challenge in other, uh, especially in our current technical education programs. Yeah, uh, I mean, where you can make a lot more of the right. Thing right. to note, though, is our own faculty here uh, received an eighteen percent increase um, in salary over the next three years. So approximately eleven percent for next year, which would be sixty-seven hundred plus the step. What was that right? Yeah, yeah, sixty-seven. Yeah, yeah, with this. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Be careful of all your good work and all the progress on this. All that by lack of being able to attract instructors. I will say this: Bend is a very desirable place to live. If you can and, afford to buy a house, and nurses are making decent money. And so this year we had to hire two full-time people. And I honestly was so worried about it, just to get, just to support our current program, and we did it. We hired two full-time amazing people. So we have been very fortunate, more fortunate than like the Portland schools because I mean, people, it's just so desirable to be here. Um, but it is gonna get tougher as we have to hire for the Madras nursing cohort and we hire for this bachelor's of science. And if we expand our current associate nursing program, we all have to hire for that too. And if St. Charles raises their salaries. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so we are looking at potential grants where we could maybe, where the college wouldn't provide differential um, salary, but if there was a grant where like a local workforce investment board could pay them a stipend separately, uh, we're looking at things like that. So, but here's the thing, when you teach at the college, you don't, you know, they don't have to work in the summer potentially, and our benefits are amazing, and the stress level, this is all, in all seriousness, uh, nursing is a stressful occupation mm -hmm. and um you know it's just a lot less stressful they're not working night shift and so it, it is a desirable you guys get the week after christmas off i'm <laughs> 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 working that week i just think of you all and you know, you're probably doing like relaxing fun things <laughs> Well, in all truth, they're probably prepping their classes for the next week. But True, yeah. I know you work very hard, but still. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you very much. Um, this is very cool. Yes. Exciting. Okay.
So we have this one here later. Yeah. I think mean, we should we read the resolution yeah. exactly. I didn't know that. Or do you want to read it? Or you no, know? I was okay. just asking the question yeah. point of order. So go, yeah. go for it. I think this is what Julie made sure was accurate. Right? Yes. So, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, whereas Central Oregon Community College fosters student completion of academic goals, prepares students for employment, assists regional employers, and promotes equitable achievement for the diverse students and communities we serve, and whereas a Bachelor of Science nursing BSN degree addresses affordability, increases access to educational opportunities, and meets workforce demands across the district, and therefore be it resolved that the Central Oregon Community College Board of Directors does hereby approve the development of and offering of a Bachelor of Science nursing BSN degree at Central Oregon Community College. Second. Okay. Motion to name seconding. Any other comments? Everyone in favor, please say aye. Aye. Anyone aye. opposed? Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I will just say that thank you for that. And the only way it would stop is if the governor doesn't sign it. The contingent on. We'll be watching for news. <laughs> okay. It's still on your desk right now. It is. Yeah. <laughs> like literally. It's still on right now. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Um, our, our next item in regards to the August, August meeting. Uh, typically, traditionally, um, we have not had an August meeting, uh, at least the 11 or 12 years I've been doing this. Um, if there is any reason, uh, we can certainly uh, have one, but does anyone have a reason to meet in August? I move that we cancel the August meeting. <laughs> Good. All right. So um, this is actually an action item. Right? Yeah, we actually have to vote on it. That's my understanding. Yeah. I'll start. Hey, move in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hey, no, no one wanted to be on the front page on that one. I, I know when you're when you're first sworn in, like you you're like, you know, like you know, and then after a few years, you're like, no, it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> we'll still get our work done. Yes. <laughs> Staff is all gone, so it's hard to put a meeting. Yes. Yes. Well, and certainly if something popped up that was critical, we truly make that happen. Okay, on the board of uh, directors operations uh, for our new members, uh, we'd like to be able to tell what we do in regards to on behalf of the COCC, um, not within our organization, but externally. So at, at every meeting, like to hear what you're doing, uh, we like to check up and see if you're doing your job, even though you're getting paid really high. <laughs> so, uh, Lord, why don't you start? Okay, um, so I attended the real estate committee on June 27th. Um, subsequent to that, I had a call with Paul about some issues related to the um, potential we've got a listing of the property on Aubrey's Everyone Knows. Um, on July 7th, I had a one on one with Lori. And on July 9th, they attended the strategic planning retreat. And I'll just say, echo what Joe said. The, when I was on the board, the first couple of times, I, I wondered why we did this because it kind of felt like I was reporting how I spent my summer break or something. <laughs> but then I had a number of people tell me that it's really nice to people who, for people who are involved with the college to know that board members are actually engaged in and doing something and that we care to you know show up for stuff. So anyway. That's all I have. Yeah. Um, well, on the uh, I went to the COCC commencement and it was fantastic, but just a rainbow of colors. So um, I did that too. Yes, you did do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was like, did I just fade out and didn't hear it? And then I've already asked a question where I was, I guess, facing out. So I wasn't going to thank you. Yes. I did. Um, so uh, wonderful speeches from faculty and our um, AOCC president. And um, it was great to see people out in their rainbow. Um, and then I attended the board strategic retreat. Thanks. There you go. I also attended the board strategic retreat last Friday. And then it was like, <laughs> yeah. Same place I was retreat. That was it. Okay. I went to commencement and yes, it was it was great. Mm -hmm. Um I I had a call with Karen Smith, who's the interim director of the Oregon Community College Association, and I was also at the retreat. I attended the retreat. Great. And um, June 27th, we had a real estate committee meeting. 
July 6th, I was at the audit and finance meeting, as well as the uh, board strategic planning retreat, July 7th. And I was on the audit finance too. Mm -hmm. That's just another reason why we want to make sure to know what's going on. Good. Al, Al and I can forget what we did yesterday. <laughs> yeah, or even what they Yeah, good. Thank you very much. So let's go on to the president's report in Alicia. Yeah. Lori asked me to just give a couple quick updates, and Zach's going to join me for one of those. Um, but as many of you mentioned, our graduation ceremony was this past uh, a couple weeks ago, and it was fantastic to be back in person again. Uh, we had this last academic year, over 700 students graduate and they see their certificates or degrees with about 250 of those folks walking and commencing. So it was a fabulous day. Um, it was wonderful to celebrate and it did not rain on commencement for those of you who have heard me say that for 20 years and I lost last year. Um, enrollment, uh, summer term is looking very, very strong. Uh, a lot of that is the rebound, especially in non-credit classes um, since the pandemic. But right now we're up about 12% in FTE. Uh, and with about three of that in, uh, in student headcount. So what that really means is we have fewer students registering in more classes. It's kind of how I translate FTE to headcount uh, differences. Fall is a little too early to predict, but we have already started registering students as of early May, um, but our, everything is trending upward right now. So our admissions applications are up, our financial aid applications are up. They're not always predictor of how we end, which is always interesting in my world. But uh, things are looking very positive in that sense. And we have a multitude of other uh, advising registration days still scheduled. So that's what's happening on the enrollment front. But we're starting to see those trends statewide too. What about um, student housing? Is that part of the, is that a separate registration or request? Family? They register during the flow of the year, but the admission uh, to be admitted into student housing, that application process started back in February. And we're on par with where we last where we were last year in terms of number of students who've applied and gone through the, all the different various steps we have. Mm -hmm. um, so we anticipate opening full or really close to full uh, like we did last year. The reason I ask, uh, this is probably one of the largest uh, costs as well as one that we really want to need to make sure we have a cost covered. The major part of that cost is our, our payment back on the bond as well as the interest. So as long as we're full, uh, we're just happy for it. Absolutely. <laughs> Trust me, I'm right there with you. <laughs> Been with that one for a long time. Um, and finally, Zach had some news to share about Madras in yeah. case uh, folks haven't yeah. heard of that. Thank you, Alicia. I'm just going to quickly review. Uh, we went through Jefferson County actually um, and asked for lottery dollars for our Madras expansion project, and we learned also on the governor's desk for signature. But the vote occurred that we received $4.1 million for that expansion. Oh, so we were not in line for HEC construction funds because we had those for uh, Redmond a few years ago, as you remember. So yes. Thanks to our wonderful uh, commissioners in Jefferson County and Representative Breeze Iverson and some others who championed this bill. Um, we were slotted in the lottery funds and uh, we're pretty excited about that. So, that's a big part of the wind in our sails for fundraising. So, so, where are we in the filling up there? Well, Joe, that's the part of my question. We are at 5.9, just, just shy of six committed this year, pending the governor's. <laughs> <laughs> One thing about Zach is that. Uh, he can give you always deal with the percentages, but it didn't say where are we are. <laughs> I, I appreciate you being up front with us. Zach, will you can you tell me can you shoot me an email when the governor signs that? Because I'd like to write a note to Vicky. Absolutely. We'll be doing joint press with Jefferson County. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And that's all we've got. Well, that's the shortest presence report we've ever had. Yeah. At least under uh, Lori's tenure. I'm going to sit this chair. No. Yeah. That didn't come out higher. <laughs> well, I believe I think she had her uh, eye operation in the last couple of days. I hope she's doing well. She is. Yeah. Okay. Uh, dates. Uh, we elected not to have our August board meeting. And of course, September 13th, we'll get our first board meeting. Laura. Um, that September meeting. Are we going to meet in Madras? You know, that has been a way that I've kind of messed up thing in the last two or three years. I usually we do Madras in September. Then Red. In Red. So, but we, yeah, we have not had one in Madras this year. No. Mm -hmm. I mean, no. Typically, Madras is always from September and then it's Red. You know. We've been in October and then it starts snowing, so we don't. Right. Yeah. Although, so you guys, since those of you that know, I have to be here. That's the. That is true. That is true. And you may be seeing me in December and January. Yeah. Yeah. 
So unless you, if you could uh, get that back. I'll check with Lorian. Yeah. So can we? I think we I should. Think we haven't been to, to Madras this year. But Erica doesn't like to drive in the snow. <laughs> Me? There shouldn't be snow in September. No, yeah. but I mean, that's the reason we have those meetings in Primal yeah. off, off, off the then campus. Okay. So Let me check with Lori and make sure there wasn't some other reason for that, but so we'll definitely make sure. <laughs> um, the, well, I think one of the things is because we had some change ups in May two years ago. Uh, so, anyways, but, you know, we, you know, it's a great deal with the system. Yeah, yeah, I, I think, think so too. I think it's a it's a beautiful drive in September after Mattress. It is. It is. It, is. <laughs> it really is. But we don't need, you know, all you know, ten people. Driving the snow in December just to the Yeah, and it's but, more it's more about like probably what the faculty. Yeah. You know, so there are the people who do you know how Kirk County do it remotely now. So do you know how Kirk County came to you? Yeah. Because the, the the board meeting conflicted with I was chair and it conflicted with my daughter's eighth grade um, graduation. <laughs> and so I wanted to be able to run over and attend the graduation. And Shirley goes, Well, let's just do that meeting in Rhineville instead of we were going to do like July in Rhineville anyway. So, so no to where, whoever lives wherever, if they have a child graduating, <laughs> you can. <laughs> no, I mean, you have a tradition of doing a meeting in every community, yeah. Yeah. but it doesn't have to be, you know, a specific exactly. month, right? Yeah. Let's make sure they have. Yeah, but, yeah. But, but, but if you're a chair, you can make it. If you're a chair, you can you can adjust <laughs> so it. I to want the it this September. Do we have a do we have a, a date for a retreat yet? Do you know? Um Kyle, we're, we're gonna, I'm waiting for you guys to reply to my email. So some of you have. So, so I think you have you know, <laughs> I, I respond. But I I didn't do reply all. I only responded to you and Kyle. So <laughs> You have not? No, I have to look at my calendar and <laughs> it's very stressful. It is so <laughs> okay. So if you can't do that, uh, I know that the cal cal calendars do fill up awful quick. Mine does. So um yes, and also uh, you know when, when it comes to family, Aaron was great to have your family here. Tonight. That was really cool. Uh, yeah. 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 Tattoo. Oh, oh. <laughs> hanging for a long game. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> nice to have you in. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Um, so at this point in time, we're going to end our board meeting and turn to an executive session meeting. We'll give about five minutes to our transition. Again, I'm going to shut this down. Uh, I'll be reading these. COCC board of directors will now meet in executive session for the purpose of ORS 192.66-B for the purpose of discussing real property transactions. Representatives of the news media and designated staff shall be allowed to extend the executive session. All other members of the audience are asked to leave the room. Representatives of the news media are specifically directed not to report any deliberations during the executive session except the state. The general subject of the session as previously announced. At the end of the executive session, uh, we will be returning on the board to an open session and welcome the audience back into the board. So that 